Mother's Day is less than two weeks away, so if you're still looking for that perfect gift for the person that you call mom this Mother's Day, check out the link in the top of the description. Universal Yums will send her a wonderful box stuffed full of treats from a different country. We're talking chocolates, savory snacks, potato chips, full chocolate bars. These things come packed full and everything in it is absolutely delicious. There's also really cool little games that you can play and little booklets that tell you a little bit about each treat that is in the box. It's so much fun and it always makes an incredible gift. So go down in the description below and click that top link and order a box from Universal Yums. Was there anyone else in the car with you? The voice sounded from somewhere off to the left of me. What? I asked, slowly coming back to my senses. Did you have anyone else riding with you? The voice asked as my eyes began to focus on my surroundings. Uh, yeah, I replied, suddenly growing aware of what had happened. A passenger. I was still dazed from the apparent accident I'd been in. I was just standing in the middle of a field when the cops rolled up, but I couldn't recall what had occurred. Are you sure you had a passenger? The voice asked again. Finally, more of my senses returned, and I turned to see two police officers in the field with me. One of the two was over by my crumpled car, while the other was shining a flashlight in my direction. The officer who was investigating my vehicle shook his head at the one closest to me. There's no sign of any passenger. Are you absolutely positive you were not alone? He asked, continuing an interrogation that was beginning to aggravate my heavily cluttered mind. Yes, I said loudly. I suddenly felt my heart racing. Though I was still quite bewildered by the events that found me aimlessly wandering around in the grass, I had one solitary persistent certainty. There had most definitely been someone else in the car with me. I suddenly became erratic in my actions as I ran to the car that sat on all four wheels next to the massive thick tree that stood alone in the open field. I was sure that the cops had somehow completely overlooked the man I knew to be sitting in the passenger seat. Calm down, kid, the officer who stood at the vehicle said. I have only expected him to reach for his gun when I charged toward him, but he appeared genuinely concerned about my mental state at the time. As I made my way to look through the windshield, I expected to see the hitchhiker still sitting in the seat. This would prove a much more difficult task than I realized, as the roof appeared to be resting in the passenger seat. He was in there, I exclaimed as I darted my eyes between the cops who both wore a similarly confused expression. Tell us what happened, the taller of the two asked me. That was a question I found myself unable to answer. I remembered leaving my girlfriend's house, and I fully recall driving down the road I had traversed many times before, but that was it. Somehow, I could describe the man who I knew had rode shotgun, but I had no recollection of picking him up. He was average height and build, I told the officer who had asked me all the questions up until now. He had thick, shaggy dark hair and a bushy beard. The cop was writing in his little notepad while I spoke as the ambulance came rolling up to the side of the field. He wore like a faded green army coat with a woolen sweater underneath. I continued as a paramedic draped a blanket over my shoulders. He looked like he may have been homeless or something. He was a bit dirty, you know? My head started to spin as I spoke. He didn't smell bad, I don't think, but he seemed like a really good... Somewhere in the middle of my description of the man I'd apparently picked up on the side of the road, I passed out. Sometime later, I awoke to the sounds of a busy hospital. I was being rolled through a corridor while doctors and nurses were doing their work on me. I was still out of it, but I instantly recognized the voice of the woman who came running up beside the gurney I was laying on. Oh my god, my mom screamed out when she arrived beside me. Is he okay? 
she asked. Is he going to be okay? She screamed louder to the hospital staff who seemed unresponsive to her inquiry. Your son is going to be all right, ma'am, the doctor calmly replied. It looks far worse than it is, he continued before I fell into darkness again. The next time I opened my eyes, I was laying in bed while the doctor or nurse rolled a tray of instruments up beside me. I winced as they jabbed the needle into my apparent gash across my left eyebrow. Within moments after the injection, they began to sew into the cut with a needle and thread. Ow, I said. Mm Mm-hmm, the doctor replied as he continued to weave the needle through my brow. I... I can still feel that, I said, bracing myself with every poke. Uh Uh-huh, the man in the white coat muttered as he kept sewing away. He seemed quite focused on his task as my words didn't appear to register with him. They just continued to grip down on the bedsheets every time he passed the thread through my open wound. After he finished up, I realized I also felt a sharp pain shoot through my right arm and hand. I looked down to see my knuckles shredded and my arm was a deep purple from top to bottom. In addition, my left pinky stood straight out, braced by a small metal splint. My mother still sat at my bedside, and her eyes were puffy and red while she smiled across from me. She wasn't saying much, but I assumed she just wanted to allow the doctor to do his job uninterrupted. I couldn't help but wonder if the words I spoke while my eyebrows being stitched back together had only been in my head. After the gash above my eye was closed up, the doc went to work on my hand. There wasn't nearly as much pain while he attempted to close the numerous wounds across my knuckles, but my whole arm felt numb still. There was the occasional shooting pain, but only when I tried to move it. We'll have to perform some reconstructive surgery on your ear, but we'll let you rest up before we start that. The doctor said as he got to his feet. Someone will be with you shortly. My mom began to tear up again when she spoke, and I reached up to feel my ears. I was suddenly concerned that I was missing half a lobe or something, but I felt my heart settle back into place when I ran my fingers across the slightly chewed up cartilage at the very top of my ear. Doesn't feel like it needs reconstruction, I shrugged at my weeping mother. They just want to see if they can reattach the bit that was shaved off, she replied with a smile. We talked back and forth for a while as a few more nurses and a different doctor entered the room. They investigated my ear for a bit before they got to work in their attempt to stitch back the thin strip of meat that had been severed. It would ultimately prove unsuccessful, but a slightly thinner ear was the least of my concerns at the moment. After a while, all of my injuries had been treated, and I was to be cleared to leave the hospital. It would take them a bit to have all the paperwork ready, so I took a moment to stroll to the bathroom to the side of my hospital bed. Jesus Christ, I said when I looked at my reflection in the mirror. Blood covered my entire face, and my shoulder-length hair was still matted with sticky crimson globs. My right arm was easily twice the size of my left, and it was several shades of purple and blue. I couldn't see my left pinky finger through the bandages and splints, but it felt like it weighed a few more pounds than it used to. My ear didn't look bad at all. I honestly don't know why they even bothered to attempt to reattach such a thin sliver, but I suppose it would just inflate the already enormous bill even more. I walked back out of the bathroom to see two officers and the paramedics who had aided me in the field. I was already getting prepared to answer a barrage of questions, but they only wanted to check in and see how I was doing. All four of them appeared genuinely surprised my injuries were so minimal. I guess I just got lucky, I shrugged. I didn't know that sort of luck was possible, the shorter of the paramedics exclaimed. How did you even get out of the car? the other asked. I just shrugged, genuinely unsure about anything that had happened since I left my girlfriend's house. You got someone looking out for you, kid, the officer who had interrogated me in the field said with a laugh. Eventually, 
I was released from the hospital with a few prescriptions to pick up and warnings for what to look out for with my concussion. My mom drove me to the pharmacy and then back to her house so she could keep an eye on me. I went to take a shower, but my legs were still shaky from the night's events, so I just lay in a hot bath for a while. I wanted to stay in longer, but it didn't take long for the water to become bloody and filthy, so I just dried off and put on some warm clothes. After a few days passed, my mom took me to the shop at which they'd hauled my poor, demolished Pontiac. It was only a short drive from the house, but she wanted to see how bad it was as much as I. As we walked up to the small building, surrounded by vehicles in many states of disarray, a tall, slender man approached us, wiping grease and oil off his hands with a blue towel. "'What can I do for you fine folks?' the man asked in a scratchy but pleasant voice. My mom went on to explain that we were here to see her son's car that had wrapped itself around a tree a few days back. She described the car and the location had been picked up. I'm sorry for your loss, ma'am, the man replied, bowing his head slightly. (laughs) No need for all that, my mom laughed. This is him right here, she continued gesturing toward me. The man shuddered and his eyes grew wide and shocked. After some back and forth, during which the man would not take his eyes off me, he waved us forward to follow him. We walked around the back of the building into a veritable boneyard of beaten and broken vehicles before we reached what was left of my poor Pontiac. My mom gasped and I just stared slack-jawed what lay before me. The entire roof of the car had been crushed down on top of the front and rear seats. There was absolutely no room left for one person, let alone two, to have sat. On top of that, the wide pool of blood filled the center console and the driver's seat, along with more that lined the buckled steering wheel. We were sure nobody'd survive that, our guide said, scratching his head with a grease-stained hand. Some days afterwards, we received the police report of the accident that had occurred that night. According to their investigations, I had lost control of my car due to severe weather conditions, though I remember no more than a light rain. It would appear that my vehicle flipped at the tight curve and wrapped the roof around the thick tree, crushing it down upon me. The windshield had shredded my knuckles that still had held on to the steering wheel while the window bracket crushed my left pinky finger. The wounds to my eyebrow, ear, and right arm seemed to have come from the sunroof as it wrapped around me. It was assumed that is how I made my escape. The concept is still questionable to me, as the injuries to my hands would imply I was still sitting in the driver's seat while the roof crushed down onto the chair I was sitting on. My mom and I puzzled over the events for quite some time until another question dawned on me. How did you know to come to the hospital that night? I asked her. This was the time before cell phones were so commonplace, and her address was not indicated on my driver's license, nor did I have any of her contact information on me. She went on to explain that a man had come knocking on her door that rainy night. He told her that her son had been in an accident, and he was heading to the hospital as they spoke. When I asked her what he looked like, she described an average-sized man with dark, messy hair and a thick beard. He wore military-style jackets and a thick sweater underneath. By the time she grabbed her keys and threw on a coat to head out the door, there was no sign of the stranger, who she thought nothing more about until I made my inquiry. The accident occurred in the fall of 98. Some details have surely been adjusted in my mind's eye over the years, but I still hold the memory of my passenger that night. I vaguely remember a conversation we had as I drove the familiar road, though I cannot recall a single word we spoke, nor the accident itself. It could be argued that I imagined the whole thing, or even that I gave the guy a ride to where I needed to go before I hit the steep curve. It could even stand to reason that he could have been responsible for the wreck in the first place, but I highly doubt that scenario. I don't know if I'll ever have answers to what truly occurred that night some 23 years ago, but should I ever again see the stranger in the faded green army coat, I think I owe him my gratitude. You 
You should never confront someone if you think they're a bunch of kids in a trench coat. By Sugar Soda. I recently got my first job working at a cinema that shows older movies. It's not the best paying job, but it means I get to hang out with my best friend Lisa. We were recently screaming the 2003 classic, The Room. It's one of my favorite movies, so every time I'm on my break, I'll pop in and watch it. There's always a great atmosphere when it's playing, as the customers will throw around footballs, and some even come dressed in suits. I was standing around at the ticket station, counting down the minutes until I could finally get out of here. I could see Lisa at the corner of my eye, tidying up the concession stand. It had been a quiet night, so both of us just wanted to go home. I looked toward the door and had to stifle a laugh as someone walked into the door. The person was wearing a very long trench coat that probably hadn't been washed in 20 years. It was very obvious that it was a bunch of children standing on each other's shoulders. The person on top looked no older than 10 and was wearing a very obvious fake mustache. They stumbled toward me as I stood there smiling. They asked me for one ticket to the next screening as the other children giggled beneath the trench coat. I considered letting them in, but knew my manager was watching through the camera and would give out. I leaned forward and tore open the coat to confront the children. I jumped backward and could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I uncovered what lay beneath the coat. The person had a long, thin body, and every inch of flesh was covered in tiny faces. The faces were turning their heads from side to side, looking around the room. I began backing away as every face turned toward me and began smiling. The body lurched forward, and I heard Lisa scream behind me as she must have noticed what was going on. The body reached his arms toward me, and I turned and fled. I felt a finger caress the back of my neck as it almost grabbed onto me. Lisa was nowhere in sight, and she obviously run off to hide. I ducked inside an empty theater and began crawling along the floor. I could hear the sounds of the person moving around nearby as I hid between two rows of seats. Every few seconds there would be a chorus of giggles as the faces on its body would laugh at some internal joke they were sharing. I almost screamed as a hand grabbed onto my leg and was beyond relieved to see Lisa's terrified face looking at me. We hugged each other and I could feel her body shaking with fear. We peeked over the row of seats and could see him standing at the front of the room. He was standing completely still and was staring up at the blank screen. I motioned to Lisa that we should move, but she kept shaking her head and wanted to stay here. I started to crawl away and was relieved when she started following me. We reached the exits and I peeked back to see he had turned around and was now sprinting toward us. I grabbed Lisa's hand and dragged her out of the door and slammed it behind us. We used all of our strength to hold the door closed as he threw himself at it from the far side in a desperate bid to get at us. Someone grabbed my shoulder and savagely pulled me away from the door. I stared in shock at my manager, Alan, who began shouting in my face that I didn't have permission to leave my station. I tried to explain to him what was going on, but he kept cutting me off. He forced his way past us and opened the door. I could see the momentary look of horror on his face as he realized why we were trying to hold the door closed. The creature wrapped his arms around Alan and he slowly began to get smaller and smaller until he was no larger than a tennis ball. The creature threw the ball into the air before catching it in his mouth. A new face appeared on the body and I knew immediately that it was what Alan looked like as a child. I jolted out of my shock by the sounds of laughter and I looked over to Lisa to see her doubled over and laughing with tears streaming down her cheeks. I tried to grab her hand and make her come with me, but she just shook my hand off. I could see a trace of madness in her eyes. I backed away as the creature moved toward Lisa. She reached forward and gently began rubbing the face as I covered the body. I grimaced as she leaned down and kissed Alan's face. Her face took on a sheen of happiness as the creatures embraced her in a hug. I closed my eyes as I didn't want to see my best friend like this. 
I opened them a minute later to see her smiling face adorning the creature's body. I ran toward the doors, but my feet got tangled in each other, and I tripped over the ticket station and landed face first on the ground. I looked up to see the creature standing above me and knew my fate was sealed. I raised my hand to protect myself as the creature reached down toward me. It snatched something out of my hands and I realized that one of the tickets had gotten caught in my shirt. It pulled some coins out of one of the mouths and dropped them at my feet. It waddled off toward the screens as I pushed myself to my feet and rushed out the front door. I worked overnight in a wax museum, and the figurines aren't as friendly as their human counterparts. But sugar sewed. I was really nervous as I stood outside my new workplace. My father had been the one to secure me this job as a way to pay the rent that he had enforced on me ever since I turned 18 two weeks ago. I gazed up at the exterior of the wax museum and felt a cold dread running up my spine. I took a couple of deep breaths to steady myself before walking inside. I was given a quick tour by my supervisor before he went home, leaving me to guard the place overnight. I slowly walked around the room, staring at all the famous figurines dotted across the building. I kept stopping and turning around as I had this feeling that someone was watching me. After almost two hours, I went and got some food from the vending machines as I was starving. I sat down in the office and ate while glancing at the TV monitors. I stopped with food halfway to my mouth as I saw one of the heads turn and look directly at the camera. My heart was pounding in my chest as I tried to convince myself that it had just been my imagination. I carefully left the office and made my way toward the figure who was once again facing the right way. I gently touched it to make sure it was wax and it wasn't someone dressed up. I turned around to head back to the office but froze in place while gazing from side to side. Every figure in the room had turned toward me and their smiles had widened so they looked demonic. One by one they raised their hands and began pointing at me. I ran past them and rushed into the office while locking the door behind me. I stood there, my back pressed against the door, hyperventilating. I eventually managed to calm myself down and moved forward to check the cameras. A cold shiver ran down my spine as the figurines were nowhere to be seen. I almost screamed as I heard a pounding on the door that shook the walls. My brain ran on autopilot as I walked over to unlock the door. I flinched away as a sea of smiling, famous faces waited me outside. I slammed the door in their faces before turning back toward the monitors. A wave of confusion ran through me as they were all somehow back in place. I peeked out the door to an empty hallway before cautiously making my way toward the nearest room. All of the figurines were now back to normal with the demonic grins wiped from their faces. I spent the next 20 minutes checking every room, but everything seemed okay. I made my way back to the office while telling myself it had just been my brain playing tricks on me. I let out a breath of relief as I walked into the office to discover my supervisor had come back. I patted him on the back before lurching away when the chair he was sitting on slowly spun toward me. His face was now identical to the wax figurines outside, with blood dripping from the demonic grin etched across his face. We locked eyes and I felt my bladder release as he blinked and I realized he was alive. His eyes seemed to be pleading with me to help him, but I didn't know what to do. I was thrown to one side and lay on a heap on the floor for a few moments, disoriented. I finally pushed myself to my feet and stood there, trembling in fear. A number of Hollywood superstars were scattered around the room. Two of them were holding onto my supervisor's arms as he struggled to escape from their grasp. I watched in horror as one stepped forward and began pouring boiling hot wax down his throat as his struggles finally subsided. I backed away as the figurines marched out the door one by one with my supervisor following closely behind. 
and they locked the door behind them before shoving some buckets against it in a futile attempt to blockade it. The rest of my night consisted of staring at the monitors as the figurines moved around the building. They knocked on the door a few times, but I just placed my hands over my ears to block out the sound. I must have fallen asleep, because the next thing I remember is waking up to sunlight streaming through the windows. I looked at the monitors and was overjoyed to spot the cleaners making their rounds. I grabbed my stuff and practically sprinted for the exit. I slid to a halt before the exit because I spotted the newest addition to their museum. A tear ran down my cheek while walking out the door. I hoped he didn't have any family. A Simple Wave by Will Rain Have you ever had one of those uncomfortable moments where you think someone's waving at you but they're actually greeting someone behind you? It's awkward, right? I mean, most of the time you have no idea who the person is that's swatting the air a ways off in front of you, but you feel compelled to return the gesture regardless. I've had it happen quite a few times over the years, but more often than not, they don't pay attention to my dumbass, swinging my arm like an idiot in the direction of someone I've never met. There have been those occasions, though, where they absolutely do see me there. There was this one time, this ridiculously attractive girl seemed to wave at me from a distance. Now, I'm about as good looking as your average garden variety lump of roadkill, so the fact that this beautiful lady was gesturing toward me was a very unlikely scenario. Call it wishful thinking or just plain old gullible stupidity, but I enthusiastically waved back at her wearing the widest and goofiest grin my face could produce. As soon as the equally as attractive man came running beside me, the girl started laughing almost uncontrollably. In your dreams, asshole, the guy said, chuckling as he passed by me toward what I assumed to be his girlfriend. I proceeded to do what anyone would in this situation. Pretend my wave was no more than a misread stretch to scratch the back of my head while looking around to see if anyone else noticed. Of course, others had noticed. The more embarrassing a moment is, the more people will most definitely see it happen. I made my best effort to sneak away from the various laughing faces belonging to my strangers lining the sidewalk, doing all I could to not make any eye contact through my escape. So, as I'm sure you can guess, I found myself returning a wave to a new stranger recently. I was just casually sitting on a bench in the park, chewing away on my fresh Philly cheesesteak when I caught a figure waving out the corner of my eye. My numerous awkward experiences in the past left me a little more self-aware, and I wouldn't just leap at the opportunity to assume that I was the lone target of any distant waves. After giving a complimentary scan of the environment around me, I saw that nobody appeared responsive to the weird guy who flipped his outstretched hand around in the air. I wasn't exactly convinced it was indeed me he was gesturing toward, but I honestly felt bad for the guy, so I reached out my arm and returned his greeting. There we were, the two of us, just waving away at each other while others passed. A couple of people gave me strange looks as they strolled by, but none of them seemed to respond to the guy who started all of this. After a moment, another stranger, sitting on a bench close to the weirdo who flapped his hand around at me, looked up at me from the book he was reading. He glanced from side to side before giving me a small wave with a confused expression on his face. I quickly put my hand back down and stared deeply at my half-eaten sandwich. I allowed my eyes to lift slightly to see the guy on the bench had returned back to what he was doing. The other man was still just standing there, waving at me. He was definitely looking straight at me while he undulated back and forth with his wrist. It wasn't until then that I noticed how out of place he looked. He was wearing a long trench coat, buttoned all the way to the top. He also had a scarf tucked in at the collar of the coat, and a thick, woolen hat on his head. It even had a little fluffy pom-pom on top. This wouldn't seem all that strange if it wasn't for the fact that it was the middle of June. 
It's probably a good 85 to 90 degrees right now, if I had to guess. I was currently wearing a thin tank top, cargo shorts, and flip-flops. Most others were dressed similarly, that is, of course, with the exception of this freaking oddball who was still waving his damn hand at me. Feeling more and more uncomfortable the longer the guy in the trench coat flopped his mitt around, I decided to take off. I still had a healthy chunk of cheesesteak to clean off, but I figured I'd just nuke it when I got home. I only lived a couple of blocks away from the park, so it didn't take long to get there, but my trek was far less leisurely than usual. I saw maybe three or four other people wearing their best winter clothing and waving like morons on just about every sidewalk. I was starting to think there was some kind of heavy clothing convention in town or something. None of them even looked like they were hot. I probably sweated a bucket load over the 15 minute walk to my home. Once I got back home and tossed my wrapped up half eaten sandwich into the microwave, I hope I escaped the fluttering weirdos. But I could not have been further off in that assessment. When I walked downstairs for the first time the following day, I went about things as I usually do. Fresh coffee, makeshift attempt at a reasonable breakfast for a grown man, and click on the TV. I'd love to pretend I start my day off by watching the news or something else a mature person would watch, but that ain't me. There I was in my living room, steaming cup of joe, burning pop-tarts just ejected from the toaster, and Spongebob Squarepants on the old idiot box. It was just after I settled into the couch with my feet propped up on the coffee table when I caught a glimpse of something out the corner of my eye. Before I knew it, I was standing in front of my living room window, staring out at a veritable herd of people in my front yard. Maybe 10 to 15 men and women dressed in thick coats, scarves, and hats stood in place waving at me through the glass. Other than the undulating gloved hands, they remained completely still. I'm not even sure how long I glared out at them, but I was almost entranced by the flock of greeters on my lawn. I finally snapped back to my senses and thrust the curtains closed. I returned to my cooling breakfast and tried my best to get back to eagerly anticipating my quest to hear my leg bellowing from somewhere in the background of Bikini Bottom. My efforts proved fruitless as I could not get the image of my yard full of flapping morons out of my head. The hell are they doing out there? My subconscious asked me with concern. Beats the shit out of me, I replied out loud. Finally, after realizing my relaxing morning procedure would not be going as planned today, I decided to get out of the house and away from the crowd outside my window. I decided to exit through my back door to hopefully avoid the group out front. It annoyed me to have to sneak around my own house to get to my car as if I didn't want my folks to know I was breaking out to go to a party or something. Unfortunately, my choices were limited at the moment. I silently crept to the driver's side door of my beat-up Chevy truck and reached my hand to the door latch. As soon as I pulled the door open, I felt a freezing cold grip on my other arm. I turned around to see a short, pudgy man in a puffy parka right behind me. He had his frigid left hand wrapped around my wrist while he was still waving with his right. He just glared out with a blank stare, not even looking at me while he held on tight. I noticed his breath was foggy, as though we were in the middle of winter before I yanked my arm from his grasp. He didn't even move or react to this, he just kept standing there, gazing into the beyond. I quickly shuffled myself into my truck. I immediately cranked it up and squealed tires as I shot out of my driveway. It's a good thing nobody else was on the road, since I didn't pay first bit of attention to whether anyone was there or not. I kept looking into the rear view while I sped away from my home. And I noticed the herd slowly turning around and staggering in the direction I was moving when I turned the corner that led out of my subdivision. I drove around aimlessly for a while, just more trying to occupy my thoughts than anything. I hadn't made any plans for the day, which I hoped to spend just vegging out on the couch. I wasn't about to sit there with my strange new audience just outside my window, but plans change sometimes. 
can't be helped, I suppose. I ended up settling on visiting the local coffee shop. It was a good place to chill for a while, and they even had computers available to the public. I thought maybe I'd be able to find some info on the unusually wintered clothes waivers. Of course, Google only showed me a buttload of coats and jackets at unbelievable prices, but nothing about strangers flocking to random yards and the like. Christ, a voice said to my right. You didn't actually wave back at them, did you? I turned my head to see a particularly sleazy-looking man in a wrinkled suit sitting at the table beside me. Uh, excuse me? I asked, mildly annoyed by the way he spoke. He looked like he may have been in his late 30s, early 40s. He had a salt and pepper scraggly beard and long hair tied back into a ponytail behind his balding head. You got waved at, right? He asked with a slight, I know you did, smirk across his thin face. What's it to you, man? I asked, feeling more defensive than the situation required. Hey, Minnie can actually see him, he replied as he shuffled over to the seat across from me at that table. I halfway wanted to tell him to fuck off, but I was curious about what he had to say. What do you mean not everyone can see them? I asked. They ain't exactly here, you know, he replied sort of rhetorically. I figure they just kind of leak through from time to time, you get me? Nope, I replied. I had no frickin' clue what he was getting at. He went on to explain that he worked for an organization that had researched and investigated strange occurrences. He wouldn't get into what many of these cases involved, but one in particular had to do with the strange individuals who now shambled in front of the building I was sitting in. God damn it! I exclaimed when I noticed the group forming outside the large front window of the coffee shop. Yep, you waved back for sure, he said, craning his neck to look outside. What the fuck are they? I asked. Some kind of ghosts or something? Not exactly, he replied, still studying the herd. As close as we can figure, we think they're trapped between the planes. Planes? I asked. Planes of existence. He replied nonchalantly, as though this was a perfectly normal thing to say. He turned back to face me, and he seemed to squint his eyes and look deeply into mine. They're lost, you see. He continued, still studying my face. Whether they're from our dimension or another, they can't find their way back, you with me? He asked. I think so, I replied. Though I was with him about as much as a possum was the grill of the truck that just struck him dead. I give it like a sort of sickness, he began again. They're locked in a single moment, while attempting to cling on to anything tangible. I just stared at him, with my mouth hanging halfway open. We don't know why some people can see them while others can't, but if they get someone to acknowledge them, they cling to them like a damn virus. So, what? I waved back at one of them, so now they're gonna follow me around like a lost fucking puppy for the rest of my life? I asked, growing increasingly frustrated by this whole ordeal. Nah, he replied. As long as you keep ignoring them, they'll wander off soon enough. Just give it a week or two. I let out a long sigh. <sighs> for a moment, I thought I was stuck with my own entourage of overdressed weirdos. Thank you. God, I said with a relieved chuckle. The stranger got back to his feet and clapped his hand across my back. Just don't tell anyone about this, yeah? He halfway asked. Oh, <laughs> I won't, I replied. Last thing I wanted was anyone thinking I was batshit, seeing people that weren't really there. Just be sure and never let him touch you, he said as he made his way to the exit. I'm not... Especially proud of how long it took for that last sentence to register in my brain. Maybe I was still caught up in momentary jubilation that this strange ordeal was almost over. Perhaps I really am just a singularly stupid individual. Who knows? Luckily, by the time it dawned on me, the stranger in the wrinkled suit hadn't escaped the coffee shop just yet. Wait! I called out, getting to my feet. He turned to face me with one arm outstretched toward the door handle. What happens if they touch you? 
I asked, before taking a quick glance at my left wrist that still bore a bruise-like handprint. God damn it, kid. He replied with a sigh as he pinched the bridge of his nose. It's been a few weeks since that day, and the waving crowd still gathers up wherever I find myself. The guy in the wrinkled suit, who still refuses to offer me his name, took me to meet the people he worked with. It's a small building they work out of, but they appear to have a decent amount of funding for their research. They've been running tests on me while occasionally feeding my veins with a number of different drugs, but I can't really tell what they're hoping to accomplish. I'll just keep letting them poke and prod me for now. I really hope they manage to figure something out soon. It's starting to feel quite cold in here. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories, and I hope you are having a wonderful May so far. I know it's only the first, but hey, you can always just be happy that you made it through another month. I know I'm happy that you're here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you are new here. Let me know down in the comments section below. Do you believe in guardian angels? Do you think they're a real thing? Do you think you've been saved by your own in the past? Let me know. Me personally, I've definitely had some run-ins that I think could have ended much, much worse. But, I don't know. Maybe I was lucky. Maybe there was someone out there looking for me. Looking out for me. Who knows? Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. And also, like I said, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. And I hope you all have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Good night, everyone.